Well, we're in this series called Synced with God. It started off with, uh, you know, John 15, where Jesus says, Abide in me. If you uh, abide, remain in me, you're going to be like the branch that's connected to the vine. You're going to bear fruit. And so we start asking ourselves a question, well, how do we do that? What does that mean? How do we abide in God? And um, to, to do that, we, we are looking at seven processes of, of life. And these seven things are absolutely necessary for anything to be alive. And um, the first one we had last week was respiration. And we talked about how prayer is vital for the Christian to, to have abundant life. And, and this week, um, we're looking at nutrition. And uh, nutrition, uh, here's the definition, the process, and this is off the, the kids' biology web link, like I promised you, all right? So we can all understand this. The process of providing or obtaining the food necessary for health and growth, and that's what nutrition is. Now, it's a hot subject, just physical nutrition is really hot in America right now. And I mean, our, our lifestyles push us towards fast foods, uh, that are, as we know, low in nutrition, no matter how they market it, it's low in nutrition. And we know it's bad, but gosh, the taste is so good. I mean, that the taste of fast food, it's, well, they've actually done a lot of studies where, you know, it's addictive. Rats would rather die after they've been eating fast food than eat good food. So, you know, we're about the same thing, I think. But it's just... It, it, but it's convenient, and maybe we don't have the skills to, to cook good food for ourselves. And, and I'd like, you know, I just venture to say that, that most parents would want their children to eat more nutritious foods, even right now, than what they are. We're all sitting here going, I, I want my kids to eat better, but we're in the car a lot, we got to drive through, we're rushed, we can't always do that. So, you know, uh, it's just a constant battle. And it's, you know, we think this is something that's new. There's more fast food, but it's always been a constant battle. I think, you know, in, in, the, in the caveman era, you know, there's some guy that's, you know, like, like frying the food and the other guy is broasting it. And, you know, they're going, broasting's much better than frying, <laughs> obviously. But even in our day, you know, way back there in, in old times, um, I always, I always uh, really appreciated or wanted to be the kid that had a dog in the house because we wouldn't let our dog in the house. But kids that had dogs in the house, they had a place to put their vegetables and their food off the plate when the parents weren't looking. We didn't have that. We didn't have a dog. So my mother, true story, my mother, if I didn't eat all the really gross vegetables that she put on my plate, you're going to feel sorry for me now. Good. She would take the plate and put it in the refrigerator and get it back out for the next meal. So I wouldn't eat it then. So, you know, you see pictures of me when I'm young. I'm really skinny. That's what was going on. And some, some place there's like, a, you know, one of those old refrigerators with the rounded tops. And that plate's still in there. I guarantee you, there, there, there's a landfill someplace with that refrigerator and that plate of food is still in there. But that, that was pretty common. And we were told, you know, if you don't eat your vegetables, you know, just think of all the people in China. We don't have millions of people. It was China. China didn't have enough food. Well, turns out they probably did have enough food, doesn't it? I mean, it looks to me like they're doing okay. So ev evidently we sent them all those old plates of vegetables that kids wouldn't eat. I don't know. So uh, there's a growing desire to eat a little bit more nutritious diet, more whole grains, more vegetables, fewer fats, empty calories. And what's amazing is that while our Western culture struggles with our choices of what to eat, about one billion people in the world are wondering if they'll have anything to eat. I mean, that's just weird. Here we're going, oh, what's our choices? And, you know, should I eat this or that? And, and you know, a, a million people die, the children die every year because of malnutrition. I mean, that's just a startling figure, a million Little children die because um, their, their meals are bad. And here in America, we've got plenty to eat, but our malnutrition is different because we just eat the wrong things, and so we're still dying from it. 
I mean, don't you find that to be kind of strange? I, I mean, it's, it's so weird compared to everybody else. But, I mean, we, we know all this stuff. We know we are what we eat, and we eat good foods. We feel better. If we eat empty foods, we won't be healthy. We won't feel better because nutrition is so vital for life. Now, as we learn how to remain in God or to abide in Jesus, nutrition is similar to respiration from last week. Respiration for, was prayer. And nutrition is really close because nutrition comes to us from God's word. And you hear people say, I've been feeding on the word. That's just an appropriate phrase to use. To live in Jesus, to remain in him, to abide in him, we have to receive his word to us. And I think uh, from John 15, 7, and this is one of the uh, passage that we started with three weeks ago, uh, Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Did, did you miss that phrase? If you abide in me and my words abide in you. See, it's a, it's a reciprocal relationship. Both are necessary for us to abide in him. His words have to abide in us. And abiding in Jesus is linked to his word abiding in us. And for us to live in him, we have to be receiving the nutrition of his word. God speaks to us in prayer. God also speaks to us in the Bible. And those of us that are trying to discern right now what to do, you know, in life, we're looking for answers. We need to be reading even more Bible than, than if, if we've been starving ourselves off of that, we've been a little malnourished. This is the time for us to be diligent about reading his word because God will speak to us in that. God speaks to his word. Um, God does speak to us. Uh, oftentimes we'll say the word is the Bible. Um, in Scripture, it never actually says that. I think that's appropriate to say that because the Bible does contain God's word. But God does speak to us apart from, his, from the Bible, too. We call that prophecy. Now, if somebody says something, you know, I think God is saying this, and it doesn't agree with what's in the Bible, then that's not true. And that's the Bible is still you know, the, the truth that we use to discern everything that God says. But it's vital that we know the nutritional standards of God, and his standards come to us through the Bible. And we have kind of a nutritional epidemic in America right now concerning the lack of people receiving nutrition from the Bible. 2012, just two years ago, American Bible Society uh, used Barna Research and revealed some good news and some bad news about the Bible in America. First, here's the encouraging news. 85% of households own at least one Bible with a household average of 4.3 Bibles. Isn't that high? Four point, an average home in America has 4.3 Bibles. We have like 500 probably, but you know, just you, a new Bible comes out, you buy it. But we probably skew that, but they didn't call me, so I'm not in that. So, you know, 69% of Americans believe the Bible provides answers on how to live a meaningful life. That was encouraging. Almost 70% believe that the Bible has answers on how to live a meaningful life. But here's the bad news. 26% of Americans never read the Bible. And 10% read it less than once a year. How do you read it less than once a year? I don't know. Um, but that, it, doing my math, comes up with 36%. Okay, 36%. So a third, I think that's close, of Americans have Bibles, but don't ever touch them. Now that's a little bit depressing. 79% of those surveyed believe they are knowledgeable about the Bible, but 54% were unable to identify the first five books of the Bible. You're all going, Genesis, Exodus, you know, right now. <laughs> Which side am I on here, you know? So half the people don't know the first five books, but almost 80%, four out of five people say, oh yeah, I'm very knowledgeable about the Bible. I know, yeah, I know the word. What are the first five books? Um, okay. So it tells us that we think that we know more than what we really know. And 45% believe that the Bible, the Koran, and the Book of Mormon are just different expressions for the same spiritual truths. 
half almost. Survey participants also indicated that the biggest frustration about reading the Bible was what they never had enough time to read it. Now, if you're here today and you're going, I don't have enough time to read my Bible, we're going to fix that later in the sermon, okay? So, so just hold on that. Bible knowledge and literacy are at an all-time low in America. And yet we have Bibles everywhere, 4.6 per household. It's not like we need to give Bibles out. I mean, we always have free Bibles on our table, but people don't, for the most part, really need them. We've got the Bible, okay? We've got the vegetables at home. We're just not reading them. We just don't think we're doing the fast food thing, evidently. Now, I want to show you a, a video. You probably saw this maybe, I don't know, it was viral for a while. But it, it's uh, in the... In the it's very poor resolution, but I think you'll get the meaning. This is a video, very short video, of some Chinese Christians who are getting their first Bible. This made me cry the first time I saw it. It's convicting, isn't it? They're so thrilled to get the first Bible. I mean, like for us, it's this, you know, this is like a Big Mac. It's about the same way that we feel about our food. They, they love God's word so much that they want to kiss it. And they, you can just see the way they just, they can't believe they've got their own Bible. And this is a huge topic, and I'm not going to be exhaustive on this, but, but I need to kind of sound alarm, I think, that if we don't practice daily nutritional diet of God's word, we're never going to get strong. We're always going to be malnourished. We're going to stay weak, get weaker, because as Peter said to Jesus, remember, um, <laughs> there it was in John uh, 6, chapter, he says, Master, you alone have the words of life. He alone has those words. Now, the word um, in, in Greek that's usually translated as God's word is logos, um, it's most translated as God's word. Uh, God is a speaking, revealing, communicating God. And there's a whole series here. And like I said, we're just going to go through this and, and hit a few points. But God is reaching out to us and he's desiring to speak to us. He's desiring to give us his word, his truth. And we hear people say that they've been feeding on God's word and that's so appropriate here. And I, I want to go through just a few passages that explain God's intentions and promises to, to us because like... Like hungry children, God wants to feed us. God wants to give us nourishment. He wants to speak to us, his word, his communication to us. And in the Bible, there, there's, so, there's quite a few metaphors for the word. And I want to just cover a few today. Uh, the first is in Psalm 119. And the Psalm 119 is the longest book in the Bible. It's all about God's word, God's law, God's word. And you've, you've heard this this, uh, this passage before, it's Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God, the communication of God to us guides us. Some, like I was saying earlier, some of us are looking for some guidance. Most of us, you know, every month they're looking for some guidance about some things, some things. Well, we, we know what to do on some situations because he's told us in his word. And people so often ask for, for direction, you know, like, should I take this job or should I move here? Should I go in debt to start this business? And, and God directs us in prayer, but, but he also directs us in his word. And we need to be praying and reading at the same time. 
Plus, there are a lot of things in his word where he gives us a lamp to our feet of, of things that have really simple that we don't need to ask direction for. For instance, I, I don't need to ask God's direction if I should forgive my boss. It's already been revealed. <laughs> we forgive if we want to be forgiven, right? So that, that's, I don't need to get discernment on that. It's already revealed in his word. So many things on how to live. But if we don't read it, if we don't listen to it, if we don't learn it, we'll never know those things and we'll be doing some of the wrong things. So his, his word is a lamp. It's revealed. It's no secret. So first God would give us insight as to how to live and how to make decisions that will bring him glory and give us abundant life at the same time. The second metaphor that I thought of was the, the one of seed. And you remember this parable. Uh, Jesus says a farmer went out to sow some seed and and he said uh, some of it fell by the path the birds ate it some of it fell in a bunch of rocks and it grew up and the sun got hot and it withered and died and some of it fell and germinated amongst some weeds and the weeds choked it out and it died and then some of it fell on the good soil and it produced a hundred more seeds is what he said now even the disciples didn't get this, and they later on they go, "What do you mean by all that seed stuff?" You know, and Jesus goes, "Yo, you know, you guys, well, you know, when are you going to start getting this?" And and he says, "This is the only one that that he really explains." And he says, "Satan's like the birds." He says, "Some of the seeds, some of the word, falls, and Satan comes and steals it away and eats the seed." And some of the seed, he says, the word uh, falls among uh, some rocks and dies. And that's, that's the word that's planted in people who fall away quickly after it's been planted. And God gives them a word. But some rough times come and, and they just, it withers up and dies. And then he says, and then the word is also scattered in it and falls in the weeds. And the weeds are like the things in life that, that compete with the word of God, with God's word. It's, it's like, you know, work and, and, and pleasure and money and all the cares of this life, he says. And that can choke out the word, he says. And then, of course, the seed falls in some ground. And this ground had been plowed deep. Okay, and it's got compost on it. I'm being generous here. All right, it's got fertilizer on it. It's good soil, and the seed germinates quickly, and it grows, and it produces a hundred more seed. In other words, the person, the word is the seed, and the word produces fruit, then multiplies to plant even more seed. Now, I think here he teaches us a lot about the word, about the logos, and the seed scattered. God's, God's word is broadcast, okay? It falls on a lot of different people in different seasons of life, and sometimes we're ready, and sometimes we're not ready. Sometimes it falls on us, and it doesn't mean anything. I, I grew up in a church, and I heard the word every Sunday. I was in Sunday school, and it, none of it ever sprouted. Or maybe it's maybe you know he came and stole it away, or or, or maybe it was choked out. Uh, but but finally, my life was plowed deep enough to get down to some good dirt, and there was a lot of compost that was put on my life, and the seed became good, and it sprouted and it grew, and I've been giving the rest of my life to multiply that seed for others. But that's the way it is. Sometimes we're ready, sometimes we're not ready. And, and I mean, I think we can believe, get this, because there's, there's times when, you know, we go to church and we hear the same thing and it just doesn't mean anything to us. This has happened to each of us. And then there comes a season in life where it's like God is speaking directly to us. It's like you open up the Bible and, and like he's going, Don, read this. This is for you. And it's everything that we read is just like revelation. Well, the seed's been scattered a lot of different places. Sometimes we're just not plowed deep enough for it to really sprout and grow. But the Word of God is like a seed. It grows in prepared soil. It produces other seed. Now, the third metaphor that I thought of is the, is the word is a sword. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews used the sword to describe the power of God's Word to us. Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is living and active 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Have you had that experience? Have you had the experience of God, a verse just hitting you so deeply? And maybe you didn't even want that to happen. And I mean, you, you think, I'm doing fine. You got this veneer on. And God's word just kind of shatters that veneer on you. Have you ever had that happen? Oh, boy, I have. You hate it and you, and you love it at the same time. God's messing with you. He's correcting you. And, you know, that is good and bad. Because he cares enough about you to speak to you and to break the veneer in your life. And you're like, how dare you mess with me on that? Thank you for messing with me on that. The word's powerful. It cuts down into our lives. And we, we go to God's word. We have to go there in repentance. We never go there in arrogance. But we have to come to him in repentance. There's no secrets with God when he speaks to you. And I mean, it can be rough sometimes and good at the same time. You know, he can show you in his word who you really are. And that usually, hold up the mirror of God's word to you, that's usually not a good thing at the moment, but then it produces some seed and some fruit that's very good. It's living word, it says. Not just literature like some people try to make it. It's not scientific history. It's not a blueprint, you know. It, it, it doesn't just speak to the modern world. It creates a whole new world to live in. And another way to put it is it's a love letter written to you about God's deep desire to give you life, and it's powerful. Now, this next one, the fourth one, you've probably not heard before, so just bear with me. I'm not trying to be funny, all right, for once. The Word of God is also called a shower. I prefer a shower to bath. Bath kind of has some dirty bath water that's left over afterwards, but the Word of God to us is like, a shower. John 15, 3, in the same section as the abide, Jesus says, already, he says this to his disciples, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. The word that he was teaching them, teaching them about the Father, teaching them about how to live, how to be followers of Christ, he says, this has cleansed you. Um, it's in the same passage he calls us to abide, where he says, he says here, you're clean because of my word. And Paul used the same uh, metaphor uh, when he was talking about the word of God to the Ephesians. And it's in the context where he's instructing about marriage. It's Ephesians 5, 25 to 26. And I think we miss this, uh, what he says about the word, because of the context of the whole, whole husband and wife submission thing. But here, uh, Ephesians 5, 25, 26, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify, cleanse her, that is, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So there's that imagery again of God cleansing us with his word. Church was set apart after he had cleansed her by the washing of the word. Man, we need that today. The church is always needing to be cleansed. Okay, with his word. The church needs, always needs a good shower in God's word. A message from him that cleanses the dirt. Now, I know that this one is probably a little bit more difficult to grasp, the idea of being washed with the word. But what's evident is that God's word, God's, God's message to us, purifies us. And I'm sure that if you've been, a, been with the Lord long, you've had this experience where you felt dirty because of the day. Maybe something that was done to you or just where you've been, and you get in the Word and you read a little bit of the Word, and it cleanses you. It, it's really renewing, transforming your mind, as Paul said in Romans 12. But it, this is necessary, us to take this nutrition in. Uh, it, it cleanses us. It cleanses out the toxins of the world. Now, the last metaphor that I want us to consider is the word of God being food. And I think this is probably one of the most common. Remember when Jesus was um, in the wilderness being tempted, and it's in Matthew 4.4, 4, and he was being tempted by Satan, and he had fasted for 40 days, and he was really hungry, and Satan says, why don't you just make some rocks into some bread? 
And Jesus replies to him with this passage from Matthew 4, 4, and he says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's quoting a passage from Deuteronomy there. So again, it's bread, it's food, see. You live by God's word. It's food to you, it's nourishment. And then in John 6, 35, uh, Jesus, this is one of the I am statements in, in John, but he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, but whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus, his, his word to us is life. See, it's, it's nourishment. It's, it, it quenches our thirst. And then there's, there's that other time when Jesus, it's in John 4, Jesus is at the well with the Samaritan woman and the disciples go in town to getting a Subway sandwich and they come back out and he says, I don't really need it. I've already eaten. I've got food that you can't see. And they go, ah, what do you mean you got food that you can't see? And he says, I've got another source of food. Same thing here. My father has been feeding me. See, I've been in communion with him. He's been speaking to me. Now, this food we desperately need is the Word of God, a word from God. And there's, there's nothing, nothing that can take the place of this. We can't volunteer enough. We can't give enough. There's nothing that we can do that can take the place from having God speak to you through His Word. Bible study is fantastic, and we need to do that. And you know what I am on Bible study. But we also need a time to listen to Him, to go to His Word. God, just speak to me there. So, it's a lamp, it's a seed, it's a sword, it's a shower, and it's food. So how are we going to do this? I mean, now the reality is, you know, that more than likely, we're sitting here today and going, I, I, I need to do more of this, I'm a little malnourished, I really, I, I need to do more than this. And so, so first of all, you've got to own that. You, ought to, you need to own it and say, yeah, I, I don't read God's word enough for my own health, okay? I don't do that. And my goal here is to convince you of your malnourishment, of our malnourishment, and to increase your diet of God's word. So I just want to give three tips here quickly. The first one is, is to ask God to meet you in his word, Okay? So as you open up your Bible, you pray, Lord, speak to me through your word today. Just a really simple prayer. Um, just kind of a side story here I just thought of. We had a, a man that we were helping who I can tell his story. And I think he'll come visit us sometime. He's back in eastern Kentucky. He was homeless for a long time, and he was living in his truck and just by chance called up. And Nine and I went to see him and and helped him with some things. We were really impressed with him. He was a really neat guy, but he was just on the ropes. And there he was with his little dog in the truck, and he didn't want to give his little dog up to go live in the Hope Center, so he's sleeping in the truck at the Walmart parking lot. After two months of sleeping in the truck at Walmart parking lot, he finally got back home. And he called me up, and he said, Don, I just want to thank you for you know being my friend and uh, for helping me. And a lot of other people helped him. It wasn't just us. That's not why I'm telling you that. But I, I said, you know, I said, you did something that was very remarkable. I've seen people get into rough jams so many times where life kind of falls apart on them and they do something stupid and they make it worse. And the stupid thing they do is worse than the jam that they were in to begin with. You didn't do that. You didn't do anything stupid. You slept in your truck, okay? You took handouts from people till your situation improved, then you went back to normal life. I said, I, I, you know, I expected you to do something dumb. And he said, well, he says, my Bible was there on the dash, because he was a strong Christian. He says, every morning I opened up my word and I prayed the prayer, Lord, speak to me today through your word. That was his prayer. Show me what to do today. He said, God always did. God always showed me what to do that day. He said, I never thought that I was lost. I always felt like the Lord. And Lord, had he, I hope he comes sometime. He's got some wonderful stories how God provided. But ask God to meet you there. Okay, ask him first of all. The second thing is read as a repentant person. A lot of people 
uh, and I'll fall victim to this, come to the Bible with an agenda of learning something so you can defeat somebody else's doctrine. Okay, I want to learn something about the Bible so I can argue against these people. Okay, that's that's arrogance to come to God's word and and want to use His word as a club on someone else. I mean, stop and think about this. But a lot of us, that's what we get into. You know, we're looking for things here to refute something that someone else said. I've never, uh, you know, I've read the Bible through many times. I. If somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I don't see that there's any place in the Bible where God commends someone with a higher IQ. Blessed be your higher education and your degrees. And I've got that, but it's just not in the scripture any place, is it? No, we come to him in repentance. We come to him in need when we open up his word. We don't come to him with something to prove to someone else. So when you come to him, expect God to mess with your life just a little bit, okay? He's going to show you. He's going to correct you on some things that are wrong. And some scriptures that you never saw were corrective before. He will do that. But we have to be willing. The the third thing, and this is what I said I was going to fix this time thing for all of you, Bible study is, is fantastic. It's absolutely necessary. We need to be in Bible study. We also need to be feeding on his word. But when it comes to this, just read a little bit in the morning. You, you don't need to read three chapters. That's, that's not feeding on his word. That's binge dieting is what that is. It's binging on his word. Okay? So before you read the three or the four or the five chapters, or you read through the Bible in one year, you can do that, but, but take just one verse, two verses, three verses, and let that verse, ponder it, let it go over and over in your mind all day. You know, just take a little bit. God, speak to me today. I come as a repentant person, and then just take a little bit, just, just, you know, like a daily vitamin you would take. So, So you don't need to eat every vegetable that's in the refrigerator the first day to get well. But, but just take a little bit. Don't, don't worry if, if you get much covered, but just pray as you read, and God wants to reveal himself, and you'd be surprised how that little bit every day can just come to life to you. Now, I want to close by giving you something. I posted this, I think, on, on uh, Facebook this week. This comes from a Haitian um, missionary who served, uh, Eleanor Turnbull, who, who served her life as uh, a missionary to Haiti, and these are the different ways, excuse me, that the Haitians describe God's word. These are different metaphors, and I, I love this, okay? First of all, she says, our great physician, your word is like alcohol. When poured over an infected wound, it burns and stings, but only then can it kill germs. If it doesn't burn, it doesn't do any good. That neat. The second one is, Father, we all are hungry baby birds this morning. Our heart mouths are gaping wide, waiting for you to fill us. Isn't that a neat picture? Third one, Father, a cold wind seems to have chilled us. Wrap us in the blanket of your word and warm us up. And then the last one, Lord, We find your word like cabbage. As we pull down the leaves, we get closer to the heart. And as we get closer to the heart, it's sweeter. Neat, neat metaphors, aren't they? Well, let's just sit for a moment in prayer.
Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out